Yeah. All right, welcome everybody. My name is um, Max Lenkheit and I'd like to do a session today which I call Building Custom Controls to Visualize Data. Um, for those of you who have seen me before doing the talk, and maybe at TechEd or at the SAP Insight Track in Waldorf last year, this will be exactly the same session, except for one slide. So if you've seen that before, we, yeah, just so you know about it. Um, I work for um, SAP Custom Development. So what we basically do, as the name suge suggests, is that we well, work together with customers and building custom solutions that basically cater to requirements that are not covered by any SAP standard solution. And um, I've, in that context, I've basically been doing UI5 for about three and a half years now. And especially with the recent rise or popularity of IoT, there's, um, I mean, this topic is becoming more and more important. So when we do projects with customers, they ask over and over again for, or they have requirements which would basically require us to implement such custom visualizations. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you today, how to do this in UI5. Disclaimer, blah, agenda. Um, to make this whole topic a little bit more tangible, I prepared a little example that you already see over there on the table, um, which I'm going to jump into in the beginning. I'm going to then walk through the development steps well, one by one, you're going to see all the code that's necessary to make something similar run, not the exact same code. We're going to look behind the scenes of the example afterwards and then just close the session with some, well, key takeaways that should get you started. All right, so let's jump into the example. Connected shipping containers, an example for custom visualizations in Fiori-like apps, if you will. So for the example, we will assume the role of a port operating company, right? So we have a huge port like the Hamburg port or Shanghai port. And in our port, we have these 10,000s or hundreds of thousands of containers. And we are basically in charge of them. We're responsible for them. We need to make sure that these containers, containers are not damaged if they are um, transported from A to B within our port. We want to make sure that nothing is taken out of these containers, if no one steals anything from them. And for example, if they carry food or something like that, we would like to make sure that the cold chain of these containers is maintained. In order to keep track of all these things, we actually decided to equip our containers with sensors. And um, we see this one over here. So this one has a, has a sensor for temperature to determine whether the cold chain has been interrupted has a sensor for tilt, which tells us whether it fell down or if it fell off a truck. And it has a sensor for brightness, which basically tells us if the door has been opened and someone went into the container without being authorized. Yeah, and we can do this for all of these thousands of containers. And then, of course, we want to monitor this. And in order to monitor this, we naturally need some kind of Fiori application, ideally. So let's directly jump into our demo application. So this is my Fiori Launchpad, as you probably all know it, and I have three applications in there. Well, usually, if we want to monitor thousands of containers, you see the container app here, we would probably go into an app which would look very similar to this one. So a very typical master detail app, you would have a list with, in this case, 1,002 entries, one for each container. You could jump into the details, it's more like a dummy application. Same old thing, we've seen this over and over again, boring. So let's do something which is a little bit more fun. Because what I have here is my port control center. And if I open that, whoop, there we go. Actually see a, let me do this full screen, a 3D-ish kind of SimCity 3000-like visualization of my 1002 containers in my port. And I can also see where they are in the port, right? I could even take this one step further and put trucks on there and do whatever I'd like to, right? So now the cool thing is that we actually, or that we can actually connect this UI to this guy here, right? There's a beagle bone running in this thing, which is similar to Raspberry Pi. And um, I'm going to switch roles. I'm not going to be the port operator. I'm going to put on my nasty mask and be a thief, OK? So I'm going to go into the container when it's dark outside and stuff like that. I'm going to break into the container and take something out. 
And as a thief, um, when, when I do this, the port operator should obviously be notified that something is happening, right? So you should pay close attention to the upper right hand corner because when I open the door, you'll see something happening there. There's going to be a notification popping in. So I do this, I'm going to be like, eh, open the door, and bam. And depending on the network speed, perfect. Um, I saw some notifications popping in, so I basically got notified almost instantly. And I also see where this, well, this um, alert has happened, so right here. And what I can do now, I'm going back to the port operator role. I can basically go to these notifications, for example, the brightness one. I can click on that and will be ready to be amazed. Zoom into the container, so basically this uh, stack of containers that's there somewhere in the port with all these uh, three levels of containers it's, it's zoomed into that stack, the individual levels are expanded, and I instantly see all the details for that. Including timestamp. Including timestamp, yeah. <laughs> so for example, if I now close the doors again, that's live data there, it should go back to, you see the brightness thing, should go, should go back to zero, depending on network and stuff like that. Yeah, usually, come on. Well, anyway. Um, the important part has worked. It's <laughs> All right. Um, so let's, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's pretty cool. And that's much better than any lame master detail app that we've seen over and over again, right? But now let's talk about how you could actually build something like that, right? Because, I mean, that's what you guys are here for, I guess. So let's jump back to the slides and get our hands into some code. How to do visualizations in SAP UI 5. Well, um, we've heard it a couple of times today. The basis for all of these visualizations to do these kind of things is SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. It's actually pretty similar to um, HTML. It's an XML-based markup. You can integrate this with any, XML, uh, with any HTML page. And the nice thing is you can also use CSS to style this SVG, probably also something that you're all familiar with. But instead of having headings or links or paragraphs and stuff like that that you have in HTML. SVG comes with a set of shapes, right? So you have a path, you have circles, you have rectangles, you have texts and all these kind of things. And you can put them together in a nice way and then create your chart, you can create your 3D container port, whatever you like to, right? It's really up to your imagination. To give you an example of how SVG could look like, we see a very simple one up there. So we basically have an SVG tag. Within this SVG tag, we have three rectangles. We define the width of these rectangles with 20 pixels. We give them different heights. We give them a different X position in the coordinate, coordinate system and some other stuff. And then we combine this with some CSS and we end up with a very, very simple bar chart, right? So this plus that is bar chart, very simple. So now usually if you do custom controls and stuff like that, you don't really want to do this all manually, right? You want to do this dynamically, and that's where usually we use the open source library for that, which is called D3.js. D3 stands for Data Driven Document, and it's probably one of the most popular JavaScript open source libraries out there. Um, it comes with UI5 because it's also the underlying framework of all the standard UI5 charts, like the VIS frame and all the things that go into that. And since it has such a huge community, um, you will find thousands of examples, literally thousands of examples online of how to do I don't know what, right? If you go to the website, there are literally thousands of examples um, on the craziest things that you would not have thought, of, thought about in the beginning. Um, what's important to know about D3.js is that it, it's not a charting library, right? So there's no API like give me a donut chart or give me a bar chart. Instead, it's really low level. It comes with data binding and you can basically say, okay, I have an array of data points and for each data, points, for each data point, render a rectangle or render a circle or do whatever you like to, right? It's really low level. And let's look into a very simple example about D3.js which will basically dynamically generate the thing that we saw previously, the bar chart. Again, really simple. You can probably spend hours and days on D3.js to understand all the details. This is really just very short, but it will already confuse you, I guess. All right. 
So what we're doing in the first line of the code is we are selecting a or we're getting a reference to an empty SVG tag, right? So imagine you have an HTML page with an SVG element with the ID SVG. It's empty and you want to render the bar charts in there, right? And the second line, we basically define an array of data points. So in this case, 30, 25, and 20. And afterwards, that's where the magic happens. Because what we're doing is we have this empty SVG container right here. And in this SVG container, we are telling this empty SVG container, OK, select all the rectangles in this empty SVG container for my array of data points. Well, now this SVG container is empty. So I'm selecting something from an empty container for an array of data points. It seems a little bit weird, right? There's nothing in there. That's basically D3.js data binding. It's weird, it's complicated, but it works. And it works very well. Because what we're basically doing in the next line is um, we're telling D3.js for all the elements that I try to select here, for all the rectangles, for these data points that I try to select, but which are just entering the screen, which are basically new to my SVG, do the following. And the following is append a new rectangle, set the width to 20 pixels, set the height based on the x attribute of my data point, and set the x attribute of the rectangle to something based on the index. Right? So again, I'm selecting something which isn't there on an empty SVG for a set of data points, and afterwards I can basically tell D3.js for each of the new data points, do the following. Again, you can spend hours on data binding with D3.js, just a very simple one, which we'll uh, continue to see in this session. All right, but those were really just the basics about the technology basics, which you will need to build something like what we saw before in UI5. So in order to do something like this in UI5, I put together five recommendations that I would like to go through step by step. And they will basically give you some kind of instructions or manual to do these things. Let's start with the first do. And the first do is that whenever you create a custom visualization, you should always wrap them into a custom control. Why should you do this? Well, it's very simple because if you do wrap it in a custom control, you can use it in multiple locations in your application. You can easily use it across applications. You can very easily leverage the data binding in UI5, which is built into the framework. And um, yeah, we use the DOM. That's some performance stuff that's easier to, uh, from a performance perspective. <laughs> well, if you do this, there are two things that you should keep in mind. And that's what you see at the bottom. I hope you can see that. And one thing is that you should use an HTML control from UI5 within your custom control as a container. And we'll see that in a second. And the second thing that you should keep in mind, second, is that you should basically trigger all the D3.js magic that you need to happen for the control to display. You should trigger that from the on after rendering hook in your UI5 control. All right, but let's look into some more code to get a better understanding of that. So we'll actually get the very basic scaffold that you need for a control on this slide. Okay, believe me. So basically, we are creating a new control, which we just call a custom chart. Well, I mentioned earlier that we need this HTML control within our custom control. And I'll explain you in a second why we need this. But first, let's make sure that we actually have such a custom control within our control. So we'll declare this as an internal aggregation, right? So UF5 has a concept of aggregations. A control can have other controls inside of it. It can either be multiple or single. In this case, we're basically saying, OK, our custom chart has an internal aggregation of a UI5 uh, HTML control, and it's internal. We need to initialize this in our init method of the control. And what we basically use this thing for is for our drawing pane, right? So we initialize an HTML control with an empty SVG tag based with a dynamic ID. We'll need that later on to access the SVG tag. Um, we do this because in this control, we will later on render all the dynamic D3 or SVG content, right? So you might ask, why do we need this HTML control? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Um, the reason for that is um, basically the rendering, rendering mechanism of UI5. So if you build a standard UI5 control without any of this fancy stuff, 
when the control is re-rendered, what will happen, or what at least what used to happen, I'm not sure if it still happens, is that they basically wiped away the entire DOM that belongs to this UI5 control, and then the entire DOM is re-rendered, right? So if you just have an SVG with like three rectangles, not really, doesn't really make a huge difference, right? But imagine you have a fairly complex SVG with like hundreds or even thousands of SVG elements and was very expensive from a browser perspective to, to generate this SVG, you wouldn't want to really like um, uh, throw everything away and create it from scratch. No, you would like to keep it. And that's exactly what, the, what this HTML controller is doing. So when our custom chart is re-rendered, what the rendering en engine of UI5 does is to take the entire content of this SVG thing, put it aside, render everything around it from scratch, and then take the content back and put it in there, right? So basically our SVG elements or the text that we created dynamically will not be regenerated from scratch by UI5, but only when we as control developers decide to do so. That's the whole reason why we do this, okay? So the actual renderer of the controller is fairly simple. So um, we have a diff element there, we have this control data. Let me put that away real quick. That's better. Um, yeah, we have the diff element, and in this diff element we just render basically our empty SVG thing, right? So the initial markup of our controller will basically be opening diff tag, opening SVG tag, closing SVG tag, closing diff tag. Very simple, that's all we need. And as I mentioned before, then all the magic of D3.js happens or should happen on after rendering. Right? So that's basically the same code that we had previously that dynamically generates those three rectangles. So we have a static array with our data points, 30, 25, and 20. We select this container that we created here with this dynamic ID. And then we're trying to select all the rectangles in this empty SVG. None of them exist. We try to select them for this array of data points. And then we tell D3.js for all the data points that we try to select, which weren't there, do the following, which is append a new rectangle, set the width to 20 pixels, blah, 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 blah. Right? Same thing as previously, but just not on after rendering. So with that, we would basically have the same bar chart that we had previously, but already wrapped in the UF5 control. And you would be able to take this, put this into your XML view, into your JavaScript view, and it would work. That's really all you need. And down here, in on after rendering, that's where you can get crazy and create, I don't know, the, the next big thing. So there's one problem with this, and that's down here in on after rendering. Because right now, we have the data hard coded in our control, and that's something that we don't want to, right? What we would like to do, and I'm getting to the next do, is to get the data from a model, right? We'd like to do something like this. We write the data into a JSON model or an OData model. When we create the control, we tell the control, hey, here's the data from the model. Use that data, and then based on the data, display it visual, right? And the benefits of doing so is that we can easily exchange the data source. So you can switch from a JSON model to an OData model or even an XML model. Um, yeah, the control itself doesn't have to worry about whether it's OData or JSON or whatever. And what's really cool is you get features like filtering and sorting out of the box for free. So there's nothing you have to do in the control to enable filtering or sorting as long as you use that. Right? Very cool feature. I think so. Okay, but how do we do this again? Right? So there are a couple of changes that we need to do to our control. So you see what we like to, would like to do at the top, and down here we'll see what we need to modify on the control. So whenever you bind an array of data to a control, you again need an aggregation. That's something that's, well, that UI5 requires you to do. And you see there, I call this aggregation data. And let's declare this in the metadata. So I'm going to say my custom chart has a data aggregation. And I also define a type. I'll get back to that in a second. In this case, it's just a managed object. Don't worry about it for now. So we have a data aggregation. I define this in the metadata. So what the framework now does for me is the following. It automatically generates some methods for me on this control. So for ex example, I would now be able to call a get data method either from outside the control or from within the control. So if I bound this control like this, 
and I called get data, what I would get is an array of three managed objects and each of those managed objects would be bound to one of these objects, right? So there would be one managed object representing x30, one for x25 and one for x20. And what I could do now is I could just take this array of managed objects and pass it to d3.js as the data points and then work with that. That seems pretty obvious, I could do that. But that's a pretty bad idea. Um, I've done that. It was very painful to basically figure out that it was a bad idea in the beginning. It took us like, I don't know, six months or something like that. Uh, <laughs> we ran into a lot of pro uh, problems. We did a lot of workarounds and eventually it was just a huge mess. Okay, but why should you not do this? Well, essentially it comes down to that you are trying to mix and match two different ways of, or two different life cycles of objects, right? So D3.js has a different life cycle than UI5 and um, especially with aggregations, um, so D3.js stores references to these objects and they might already be destroyed by UI5 and then you have a reference to something which is already destroyed, it's just really, really messy. Just don't do it, okay? There's a different way of getting the data. And that is a little bit tricky. It's the following. So actually, we don't care about these managed objects, right? We don't want to call get data and get these managed objects and pass them to D3.js. We actually, I mean, what we'd like to do is to just get these plain JavaScript objects. And that's the code for that. So instead of calling get data, we need to go through the binding that is created by UI5 when we bind such a control to a data source. So we get the binding object for the data aggregation. That gives us a binding object. Then on this binding object, we call a method which is called get contexts, which will, in this case, give us an array of three context objects, each of them representing one of these JavaScript objects. And from these, well, that's map native JavaScript function, from, this, from these context objects of UI5, we call the get object method, which will basically give us exactly this plain JavaScript object, exactly what I put in there. So these three lines of code will give us exactly the array as we see it up there. Right? There are no managed objects, no nothing, no waste that we don't need. We just get the plain objects that we want, and then afterwards we can pass them to D3.js. And this binding and get context already takes, in, takes, account, takes into account filtering and sorting and stuff like that, right? So that's where you get these features for free. So unfortunately, pay attention to the top, we need to make a little change here. We still need to tell UI5, we give, need to give UI5 some kind of template that's cloned or copied for each element in the aggregation. That's really just a workaround, but that's something that UI5 asks you to do because I mean, this is more like an edge thing. Yeah, um, to give you some assurance about this, the same approach for data binding is also used by all the standard SAP UI5 charts. So there's nothing that I made up. That's, yeah, I found out about this after the other thing didn't work. <laughs> okay, so that's what you need to do in your control in order to enable data binding, all right? It's not a lot of code, but it's not intuitive either. Okay, second do. First do custom controls, second do integrate it properly with data binding. Let's look into the third do. So you probably know that SAP UI5 comes along with different themes, right? So currently the main theme is Blue Crystal. There are other themes like the high contrast black theme. And um, I mean, users are able to switch the theme, right? So you, if you develop a custom control, you would like your users, um, if they switch the theme, that they see the control accordingly, right? So what you can do in order for that to work is to use the theme parameters which are available in UI5. And well, there's an API for that which you, which you can just call. So the code here is basically the same that we saw previously, but in addition to that, I'm also setting a fill attribute which will basically set the fill color of each of these rectangles. And I'm not, I don't have a fixed color or a static color. I determine the color dynamically based on the theming parameters. In this case, the SAP UI chart one, two, three, four, five color or theming parameter which will give me, for example, a blue color, a green color, a red color, a yellow color, you name it. And if you change the theme, it will adjust accordingly. Um, one hint, if you don't know all the theme parameters, <laughs> I, uh, hundreds of them, I don't know 
many of them. Um, you can just call this API like this pa theme parameters dot get in the console without any parameters and will give you the entire list and you can just browse and see what's what. Okay, theming. Next thing, quick and dirty, you should think about making your control responsive and I already had a comment uh, earlier today, responsive can mean many things, right? It can mean I don't know, on a smartphone it should be zoomable and pennable and I want to drag things around or I just want to hide certain parts of it and stuff like that. Um, this is, uh, these topics are more on a D3JS level or something like that, but um, what I would like to focus on here is what you can do on a UI5 control level um, because I think that's something that's not really well known. Uh, well, why would you like to make your control responsive? Well, obviously because you would like to make it available on multiple form factors and multiple devices, right? So there is something in UI5 which is called the resize handler, which is triggered whenever the control is resized or when the size changes, right? And integrating this is very simple. So usually what you do is an on-after rendering, you just register your control. This is a reference to your control. To the resize handler, with an with a appropriate callback, in this case on resize. What's very important is that you have to unregister or deregister uh, from this callback both in on before rendering and in on in exit. Why need, do you need to deregister in on before rendering? Well, because if you don't do it and the control is rendered multiple times, you would end up with multiple calls to the on resize callback when the, when the control resizes. Why do you need to do it in on exit? Well, if you don't do it in exit, you might end up with some kind of memory leak in JavaScript because something somewhere still keeps a reference to the function here and then it's not cleaned up properly and it just gets messy. And in the on resize method, you can basically do whatever you like to do, right? You get access to the current width and the current height. I think you get also access to the previous height and width and then it's really up to you what you would like to do with that, right? Um, change elements, you'll see an example later on. It's really up to you. Okay, so those were the four do's. Let's talk about one don't. It's really just very simple and maybe stupid, but that's something that you should really keep in mind. Um, what you should not do is re-render everything from scratch. I mean, we already have this HTML control, right, which keeps our entire SVG DOM stable and doesn't throw it away and we have to recreate it from scratch. No. Um, we have it there, and so an on-after rendering, I mean, UI5 has a rendering cycle which might render your control without you even, even intending it to, to actually re-render it. So that's why in on-after rendering, there are probably a whole set of things that you would, would only like to do when it's rendered for the first time, right? For example, I don't know, create some background stuff that's always there and, you know, and only all the dynamic stuff you would probably like to do every time it's updated, right? So very simple, but that's something, something that you should keep in mind for performance reasons. All right, so those were the five do's and don'ts that I wanted to touch on, and I hope that was beneficial for you. What I would like to do now is to quickly look behind the scenes of the example that we saw, right? Because obviously it's a little bit more complicated than what we saw here, but you'll also see um, the individual pieces and um, pieces again. So I'm gonna go to my web IDE, which is the IDE of my choice, and all right, so what was the first thing that we learned? We learned that we need an internal HTML aggregation. And that's exactly what we see here. So I have the HTML aggregation defined here. And just as we saw it, and in init, same coding basically. Um, I create dynamic ID. I create this HTML control. I'm not directly using an SVG. I have a diff wrapped around it, but you'll see the SVGs in a second. And then container ID, let's search for that. Where do I use this? Right here in init chart, it's an internal method. There I select this container and then for this container you see I am doing some stuff with that. I'm calling some D3JS magic on that and appending some shadows and that, then appending some SVGs. So basically I have the container created in init and then at some point in time I'm rendering stuff into that with D3JS, right? Exactly what we saw previously. And also this in a chart, let's see where I call this. Who knows where I call that? On after rendering, right. And I only call it once because it's expensive and I don't need to do it over and over again. All right, so we saw that as well. And the, the other thing is, where was it, the data? 
So in this case, I didn't call it data aggregation, I call it containers. So I'm also doing the same stuff here. I have containers. Oh, where is it? There we go. I get the binding. There's a little bit of other stuff around it. Get the binding, and from the binding, I get the context. I map it to the objects, and I'm basically, I basically end up with Oh, can you see that? It's probably pretty small in the back. I'm sorry for that. I didn't pay attention to that. Um, I basically end up with the, with the plain JavaScript objects, right? So you see it's pretty much the same coding um, or the same, the same concepts that I showed you, right? Just with a little bit more tweaks around it. And also for the responsiveness, so what I did here is in on after rendering, um, registering to the resize handler. I have a callback which is called on resize. That's at the very bottom. Um, I'm deregistering in on before rendering and also an exit. And then in on resize, I'm doing something, some stuff here, right? So I'm recentering the map and based on the width, the current width, I'm basically changing the logic of my control. And we can see this in action. So. I guess I have to start it real quick. Oops, sorry about that. Little glitch. Okay. Come on. To see that in action. So now if I, if I resize it, I reset, we said that it centers the map again. And you see that this is exactly what happens, right? So when I just drag it somewhere else and then change the width, it's recentered. So basically responding to the resize thing. And also what you will notice I, when I now expand a thing, it, the size is pretty big of the container stack. And if I make it very small, I, nah, come on, I change the logic of the control so that the zoom isn't that big anymore. It's now actually pretty tiny. So, you know, just to give you an idea of what you can do. But that's really up to you. All right, so we looked behind the scenes. We saw the example. Key takeaways, what should you have learned from the session? Well, building UFF controls with D3JS is actually not that difficult, right? So what we saw on the slides, that's really the minimum, minimal scaffold of a control that you need. And that was maybe, and it wasn't even 50 lines of code. And understanding those 50 lines of code wasn't even that difficult, right? The difficult part comes when you actually need to, well, do the D3JS magic, right? And think about how you would like to visualize it. But really, that's really depending on the scenario and not really a UFF issue anymore. Um, what's also really nice here is, I mean, doing these kind of things really helps you to tailor your application to the user's needs, right? It can really improve the user experience and just really add value to the scenario. So now it's really up to you, right? So you got the scaffold. Um, you can basically just take it, then look into the D3JS website and mix and match these kind of things and really try to enable any of the things that you need from the examples of D3JS in UI5. All right, and with that, I would like to thank you. And um, I'm open for questions, and I think I'm over time. Yeah. One thing, yeah. what was the way you designed the containers? Did you hmm. start it to, um, to, to move it by creating code and then see how it works out? Or did you take a vector graphic program to design it first and then see what you'd like to generate afterwards? No. So um, for, the, for the example, there was a designer involved who came up with the idea. Um, but it was like he just came up with the idea and draw it on a piece of paper. Okay. And then I did not have any like SVG design program or anything like that. Um, so I really started out doing the math. Like I okay. calculated all the angles and stuff like that. So maybe that's an important thing behind this. So um, I mentioned that SVG comes with shapes like rectangles and circles and stuff like that, right? It does not come with any 3D shapes. So what's behind this is basically rectangles, right? So uh, it's actually paths, so I'm drawing individual paths. So if we look into uh, the code for that, um, you see that a container shape consists of a background path, then a top that's basically this guy here, then you have the right, which is this guy, and then the left, which is the other guy. But I really, I mean, I sat down and did the math and then wrote a little add-on. The thing is, at the time, I didn't know how this thing is called, so I was doing some Googling and didn't find anything. And then I just decided, OK, I'm going to create my own D3JS add-ons. And after I was done with everything, I found out how this is called, because it's called isometric projection. Uh, 
And if you search for isometric projection, you'll actually find dozens of examples and already like ready to use plugins for D3JS. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. There was another question. Uh, sorry, does it answer your question? Okay. There was an, yeah, there. Uh, I have one general question. Since there is, for SAP UFI, there is visual business, which also offers some similar functionality. What was the reason to go to this solution? Or? Uh, showcase. Okay. So um, I originally did this for TechEd, and um, my original idea, my, my, well, I was asked to do a session on UI5 and IoT, and then I felt, felt like doing something with SVG and D3 would be cool, and then I was basically talking to a whole bunch of designers, and then they eventually came up with this. Yes, there is something similar from SAP, like a product which is called Visual Business, which has like two D3, um, uh, two, two 3D, uh, capabilities and that's also available in UI5. Um, yeah, there was no it, technical yeah, no, there was no technical reason for that. It just evolved into this over time. Any other questions? Yes, please. Just curiosity, what, what kind of logic do you have in the redraw method? What do you move into redraw? What, what did I move into redraw? What kind of logic do you have there? Um, if only I knew that from the top of my head. Let me quickly have a look. Redraw. It's probably easier if I just... Ah, come on. Redraw. What do I do? Oh, that's where I basically get the data and then just update all the containers. So every time the control re-renders, you update all the containers? Um, I think so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I was just wondering I, what, what logic to put in the initial uh, Okay. Yeah, it's it's simple. So I mean, again, that's what I what um, what I um, so basically in the initial rendering, I put all the static stuff, right? So that's where the water is created. That's where the shadow here is created. That's where the port itself is created and the road and stuff like that, and all the dynamic stuff, basically the containers which could potentially change. That's what I put into um, the the redraw method. But again, I mean, it's really depending on the scenario. So. If you, if you figure out that this becomes a performance issue, then you would probably need to do some optimizations and just, you know. You could also have put the containers in the initial drawing and then just modify them dynamically somehow around. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. The thing is, in the initial rendering, you might not have the data. So this data is actually coming via OData from, from an HTTP oh, service. Right on, yes. yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I'm no, uh, really over time. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, Coffee break. break. Okay. Uh, so maybe we can cut here. If you have further questions, I hope you won't just go. Nah, no. Nah. And then you just can ask them afterwards, maybe. Thanks a lot. It was a cool demo and uh, a great uh, lecture. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.